Hello. We're reading chapter 7 of The Lesson Before Dying. So we left off with Didri allowing Grant to see Jeff at the jail cell. Uh, he was seen by four men at the kitchen and he wanted to remain not so smart. Alright. Continuing from chapter 7 on page 51. Two things happened. At this school during the weeks before I visited Jefferson in jail. Two things happened at the school during the weeks before I visited Jefferson in jail. The superintendent of schools made his annual visit and we got our first load of food for winter. We heard on Monday by Farrell Jarrow, who had gotten the news from Henry Pitchett, that the superintendent was going to visit us some sometime during this week during the week, but we didn't know what day or time. I told my students to take baths each morning and wear their best clothes to school. After the Pledge of Allegiance in the yard and the recitation of the Bible verses inside the church, I would send a student back outside to look out for the superintendent. If the student saw a car, any car, turn off the highway down into the quarter, he or she was supposed to run inside and tell me. The superintendent didn't show up until Thursday. By then, we had had many false alarms. The minister of the church, who didn't live in the quarter, had made a couple of visits to church members. A doctor had come once, a midwife had visited a young woman twice, an insurance man had shown up, a bill collector from a furniture store had appeared, Henry Pitchett had driven through the quarter at least once each day, and family and friends of people in the quarter had also visited. On Thursday, just before 2 o'clock, the boy I had watching for cars ran into the church. Another one, Mr. Wiggins, another one. All right, I said to the class, keep those books open and look sharp. I passed my fingers over my shirt collar and checked the knot in my necktie. I felt my jacket to be sure both flaps were outside their pockets. I had three suits, navy blue, gray, and brown. I had one on the blue one day, today. In the yard, I passed the tips of my shoes over the backs of my pant legs. Now I was ready to receive our guests. This time it was a sup the superintendent. He stopped his car before the door of the church. A thick cloud of gray dust flew over the top of the car and dotted into the quarter, and down into the quarter. The superintendent was short, fat man with a large red face and a double chin, and he needed all his all his energy to get out of the car. Doctor Joseph, I said. Hmm. Stifling, he said. I thought it was a little cool. Yes, my myself but I figured that anyone as heavy as he was must have felt stifled all the time. He wheezed his eyes across the shallow ditch that separated the road from the churchyard. He looked up at me but I could tell he didn't remember my name though he had visited the school once each year since I had been teaching there. Grant Wiggins I said. How are you Higgins? Wiggins sir I said. I'm fine. Well I'm not he said. All this running around more schools to attend. Dr. Joseph visited the colored schools once a year, the white schools probably twice, once each semester. Well, there were a dozen schools in the parish to visit, if that many. We're honored that you took this time for us, sir. He grunted and looked around the yard. There was a good breeze coming from the direction of the cane fields, and it wav wav wavered the flag on the pole in the yard. Place looks about the same, Dr. Joseph said. Things change very slowly around here, Dr. Joseph, I said. Hmm, he said. I motioned for him to precede me into the church. He needed all this, all his strength to go up to, up to the three wooden steps, and as he entered the doorway, I heard Irene Cole, the sixth grade student in charge, call out to the class, Rice, shoulders back. I followed Dr. Joseph down the aisle and, other, and on either side of us, the students from primer through sixth grade, from primary through sixth grade, stood up still and as straight as soldiers for inspection. I nodded towards my desk for Dr. Joseph to take my chair. He grunted, which meant thanks, and pulled the chair farther from the desk before he sat down. He needed the extra distance from com for comfort. Irene was watching me all the time, and when I nodded to her, she called out to the class, Seats! And the whole school sat at once. We had been rehearsing this morning and afternoon for the past three days. Students, I'm sure you all know Dr. Joseph Morgan, I told him. Dr. Joseph is our superintendent of school here in St. Raphael Parish. He had taken time out of a very busy schedule to visit us for a few minutes. 
Please respond loudly. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Which they did loudly. Dr. Joseph acknowledged their greetings. Hmm. Dr. Joseph, we're at your service, I said, and sat down on one of the benches against the wall. Dr. Joseph leaned back in the chair and still his large stomach nearly touched the edge of the table. He looked over the classes from one side of the aisle to the other, as though he was trying to catch someone doing something improper. He looked over the classes from one side of the aisle to the other, as though he was trying to catch someone doing something improper. Primer, on your feet, he said. They stood up, seven or eight, eight of them. Dr. Joseph looked them over for a moment. Then he told the little girl at the end of to come forward. She took a deep breath and looked at the girl standing beside her before coming up to the desk. She was afraid, but she came up quickly and stood before the table with her little arms tight to her sides. She would not look up. Nothing to be afraid of, child, Dr. Joseph said to her. What is your name? Gloria Herbert, she said. I can hear you. And you, I can hear you if you keep your head. I can't hear you if you keep your head down," Doctor Joseph told her. She looked up timidly. "Gloria Hebert, that's a pretty name," Doctor Joseph said. "How about your hands? Hold out your hands." She must have thought she, she must have thought she had said or done something wrong because as she held her hands out across the table, palms up, I could see them trembling. "Turn them over," Doctor Joseph told her. She did. "Uh, huh," he said. "Relax." She did not know what he wanted her to do. Lower your arms, child, Dr. Joseph said. She brought her arms back to her sides and lowered her eyes as well. Did you say your Bible verse this morning, Gloria? Yes, sir, Dr. Joseph. Well, what did you say? He asked her. I said, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Dr. Joseph. Hmm, Dr. Joseph said. Seems I've heard that one before. But you're, bright, but you're a bright little girl. You tell your folks Dr. Joseph said that you ought to be proud of you. They ought to be proud of you. Go back to your seat. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, she said, bowing and turning away quickly. She smiled as she faced forward again, but no one else was smiling. Primers, take your seats, Dr. Joseph said. First graders, on your feet. And he called on to one boy in class who I wished had stayed home today. He was without doubt the worst child in school. He came from a large family, 13, 14, 15, I don't know how many. And he had to fight for every crumb of food he got. At school, he did the same. He fought if he played more. He fought if he played marbles. He fought if he played ball. He fought if he played with hide and go seek. He fought if he played hide to switch, hide the switch. In class, he fought with those who sat in front of him, beside him, behind him. I had punished him as much during the last month as I had all the other children put together. Doctor Joseph asked his name, and he ran to, together three words even I couldn't understand. His name was Lewis Washington. Junior, but what he said didn't sound anything like that. Your hands, Dr. Joseph told him. The hands had been cleaned an hour before, I was sure, because I had checked each pair when the students came in from the dinner. But now the palms of those same hands were as black as grimy, grimy as if he had been pitching coal all day. Did you pledge did you pledge alliance to the alliance alliance allegiance to the flag this morning? Dr. Joseph asked him. Yes, sir, he said. Not yes, sir, as I had told him a hundred times to say, yes, sir. Well, Dr. Joseph said, want me to go stand outside and salute the flag, the boy asked. You don't have to go outside, Dr. Joseph said. You can show me in here. The boy raised his hand to his chest. Pledge legion to the flag, ninety state, America, er, er, yeah, which is stand visibly, amen. Dr. Joseph grunted. Several students giggled. Dr. Joseph seemed quite satisfied. I would have to do a lot more work. For the next half hour, it, it continued. Dr. Joseph would call on someone who looked half bright. Then he would call on someone who he felt was just as, just the opposite. In the upper grades, 4th, 5th, and 6th, he asked grammatical, mathematical, and geographical questions. And besides looking at hands, now he began inspecting teeth. Open wide, say ah, and he would have the poor children spreading out their lips as far as they could while he peered into their mouths. At the university, I had read about slave masters who had done the same when buying new slaves, and I had read of cattlemen doing it when purchasing horses and cattle. At least, Dr. Joseph had graduated to the level where he let the children spread out their own lips, rather than using some, some kind of crude metal instrument. I appreciated his humanitarianism. 
Finally, when he felt that he had inspected enough mouths and hands, he gave the school a 10-minute lecture on nutrition. Beans were good, he said. Not only just good, but very, very good. Beans, beans, beans. He must have said beans a hundred times. Then he said fish and greens were good. And exercise was good. And exercise was good. In other words, hard work was good for the young body. Picking cotton, gathering potatoes, pulling onions, working in the garden, all of that was good exercise for a growing boy or girl. Higgins, I must compliment you. You have an excellent crop of students, an excellent crop, Higgins. You ought to be proud. He said the same thing the year before, and he called me Higgins then too. And the year before that he had said the same thing, but he called me Washington then. At least he was getting closer to my real name. Rise, Irene called to the class. They came up to their feet, their heads up, their arms clasped to their sides, but instead of feeling pride, I hated myself for drilling them as I had done. Dr. Joseph and I went down the aisle. Outside, he looked up at the flag waving on its bamboo pole in the corner of the fence. I thought for a moment the superintendent was about to salute it, salute it, but he was just either too tired or too lazy to raise his hand. Doing a good job, Higgins, he said. I do the best I can with what I have to do. What I, with, with what I have to work with, Dr. Joseph, I said. I don't have all the books I need. In some classes, I have two children studying out of, out of one book, and even with that, some of the pages in the book are missing. I need some more paper to write on. I need more chalk for the blackboards. I need more pencils. I even need a better heater. We're all in the same shape, Higgins, he said. I didn't answer him. I said we're all in the same shape, Higgins, the white schools just as much as the colored schools. We take what the state gives us, and we make the best of it. Many of the books I have to use are hand-me-downs from the white schools, Dr. Joseph, I said, and they have missing pages. How can I? Are you questioning me, Higgins? No, sir, Dr. Joseph. I was just... Thank you, Higgins. He stared. He started to go back into his car. It was harder to do than getting out because he was upset with me now. More drill on the flag, Higgins, he said, the, through, the, through the rolled-down window. More emphasis on hygiene. Some of these children have never seen a toothbrush before coming to school, Dr. Joseph. Well, isn't that your job, Higgins? Yes, sir, I suppose so. But then I would have to buy them. Can't they work? He asked me. Look at all the pecan trees. He waved his hand. Can't they work? He asked me. Look at all the pecan trees. He waved his hand towards the yards. I wager you you can count 50 trees right here in the quarter. Back in the field, back in the pasture. You can count another hundred, two hundred trees. Get them off their lazy butts. They can make enough for a dozen toothbrushes in one evening. That money usually goes to helping the family, Dr. Joseph. Then you tell the family about help, he said, looking out of the roll-down window to the let me know that his visit was over. I have another school to visit. All this running around enough to give me a man, a man a heart attack. He drove away. I stood there until he had turned in his car around and stared back up the quarter. I waved at him, but he did not wave back. So chapter 7 was pretty much about the visit he got from the superintendent, Dr. Joseph something. What a rude B word. Like, what a dick. Oh, what a turmoil area. So I will write down chapter 7, page 51 to 58. So Dr. Joseph... is the super superintendent mm -hmm. my bad I don't know how to spell superintendent 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 of of schools and of schools and Saint Raphael Raphael Parish. He seems fat. He visits white schools more than colored school. Tells Grant to emphasize on hygiene 
and the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, so that's pretty much it. We will read chapter 8 next time. Goodbye.